In her uh, biography, Nora Weeks says of Bach that he spent at the time from 1913 through to 1928 in London and never left London. Which is really quite extraordinary that she, she makes a point of this because uh, apparently he had a great love and longing for the uh, sort of the outdoors, for, for, for uh, being in the wild. And yet he didn't allow himself to go until a fateful day in 1928 and I think it's probably towards the end of the uh, summer, so maybe in September 1928, he takes a train from London, from London Paddington, out to the west and came to, probably came to Abergavenny and walked out along the river to Krakow, which is about four miles. And uh, of course, before he went on this journey, he had a particular thing in mind. I've already said that he'd formulated these 12 types. So, uh, you know, the, the next one that he's got here is agrimony, which is, let's call it the joker, doesn't really matter, but, or sensitive. Uh, then there's chicory. Not sure exactly about the order of this. Vervain, Centauri, and so on, down through the twelve. And uh, so he's he's formulated in his mind the idea that there are these twelve types, and he's made a sort of characterization, a delineation of what they are like as people, how they behave, and. The first one that he's going to find a, a remedy for has got to be his own remedy, impatience. So in making this journey, he's got something very particular in mind that he's looking for. All the work that he'd done in London before with the petri dishes and the faecal swabs growing these samples. It was all looking at the external uh, factors that he could detect and determine about illness from these different nosodes that he was preparing. And it's all done in a laboratory by people in white coats and, you know, with flasks and Bunsen burners and the chemistry of medicine. And he, when he takes this journey in 1928, it seems to me he leaves behind all of the paraphernalia of the laboratory and takes with him the only laboratory that he now needs, which is himself. So here inside him is the laboratory in which he's going to be searching for new remedies. What perhaps I should have made clear before this is that it's one thing to, to uh, see these 12 types, but what are you going to do to help such people with their illness? This is always the motivation for Bach. He needs to understand why we get sick and how we can get well. So in his case, he's identified within his own psyche, if you will, what it is that causes him trouble. And he says that it's this tension, this pain, this irritable nature, which not only inflicts pain upon himself, but inflicts pain upon others. And he wants to find a, a remedy for it. What would, what would make it better? Don't forget that he's trained as a homeopath, so he's thinking in the same way as homeopaths think about a symptom picture and that which will improve the um, state of the, of the uh, person, the patient. So in homeopathic remedies what you do with approving is when you take the thing 
which is, might be poisonous, you get a set of symptoms which come up and when you make a homeopathic remedy, that remedy triggers an immune, uh, well it is an immune response, but triggers a response within the body which actually will alleviate the symptoms that are in that picture. So his, in his mind he's looking for a plant which will actually carry the information which will help the person to, who is the, the person who is impatient to, and tense to become more relaxed and more gentle. The person who is fearful help them to maybe turn towards courage and uh, a sense of uh, freedom. In the case of Tematus, it would be that the, the dreamer becomes more earthed, more down to earth. So it's, it's about balancing the uh, energies of the, the person. So in making this journey, Bach is, is actually consciously looking for a plant, in fact. He, he says, the problem with his no-sodes no is that it's still this thing uh, made from the product of the disease. It's, it's not really introducing the pure living forces of the natural world, which is where he thinks you will find the best remedies. So it, there's a lot of theoretical kind of discussion going on before this time in 1928 when he gets on the train as to what would you do, where would you go to look for the remedy or the treatment, the help that will make a new, a new way of, of uh, bringing um, a, a medicine, I think he sees it as a medicine, for a person. So, how is he going to, to look for it? He can't, he can't read the books. There are no books which tell you what plants are going to be useful. You can go back to Culpepper, and Culpepper talks about herbs. He is the traditional English herbalist. But Culpepper doesn't talk about the remedies in this for the emotional and mental state. He talks about remedies for the physical condition of the body. So he's got no point of reference, which is why he has to experiment upon himself, because only there is he going to make contact with the forces or the qualities which are going to enable him to rebalance his own being. So, what does he do? The first thing he must do is to identify within himself what is the what is the emotional state that causes the problem? And then he's going to look at a series of plants, many, many different plants, and wonder which plant carries within it the, I suppose, the similar pattern of being to what he experiences in himself. I suppose this is, this is the great leap, <laughs> because unless you do this, you're going to see him as being, as I said, a, a bit of a mystical guy who, who somehow feels something. But if you do this yourself, if you know who you are and what you are, you can go towards a plant and see that as a mirror to your own state of mind, your own state of being. And this is what I believe Bach did. So, he takes a walk along the river to Krakow in 1928, in September. It might even have been his birthday. Let's say it's his birthday. And he encounters this plant in Patians growing there, Himalayan balsam. Doesn't come from England. It's a a stranger, <laughs> and, but it's now become, you know, it's taken over, really, all the waterways of, of, uh, of the UK and, and maybe throughout Europe. So what we know that Bach did on this day in 1928, in September 1928, what we know that he did was to take some of the seeds from the Impatiens plant and prepare them as a homeopathic remedy. 
Only later he comes to a different method of preparing these remedies, which we'll talk about. So he takes the seeds and he grinds them up in a pestle and mortar and prepares a homeopathic trituration, as it's called. And this is his first remedy. So in his mind, he's still thinking homeopathically. He sees the, the, the plant and it's got within the gesture of the plant aspects of this problem of tension that he sees within himself. So there's the plant and the person and there's a similarity between them. And as he thinks, as a homeopath would think, that like cures like, this is the way that he's looking into the problem. What is it that he sees in the plant? What is it that makes him think that this plant actually would relate to his own type at all? Well, it's this extraordinary explosive force that's in the seeds. You can look at the plant. It's, it's a very beautiful picture of the Empathian's person. Every part of the plant expresses aspects of the person. It's very straight, very tall. It's got a very smooth stem and the leaves are very angular. Its gesture is very clear, very upright, very cardinal, very directed. And it comes to the flowers and the flowers are these wonderful, balanced, soft blossoms. You can see when the bee goes in how it, how it tips with the weight of the bee. It's so delicate and so much the gesture of the relaxation that's required for this mentality. But in the seeds, you see this explosive dynamic. Let's see if I can show you what I mean. What actually happens with the seed pod, which is shaped like that, is that it has these lines of force and tension. And when you touch it with your fingers, it explodes. And these pieces here kind of curl back in this sort of a way, like springs, like coiled serpents. And the seeds are exploded out with the force of this opening elasticity. <laughs> So they're fired like bullets from a gun. The Latin name for empathians is quite interesting. It's actually, I think, it recognizes this. Empathians is the plant family, the type, but it's glandula fera. Well, glans, glandis is, is the Latin word for, uh, it is actually a bullet. It, it's also a gland, but a gland in the sense that it is a little nodule. But it carries bullets, this plant. And it's these that Bach took, these seeds, and prepared as a homeopathic remedy, thinking that there would be the antidote, as it were, to this tension and irritation that he perceived as being part of his own nature. He actually came down to Krakow three times in succession, in this one time in September 1928. So he comes back and revisits it and makes these homeopathic triturations on three different occasions from the same plant, or from the same place, let's say, different plants. So he's kind of really thinking into an idea and trying to both discover something which is different and new, but also related to all that he has of experience of the traditions of herbal medicine and his understanding as a homeopath and as a medical man who's been working for many years on the subject of uh, how to help people out of their chronic emotional and physical conditions. At the same time as he's down there in Krakow, he finds two other plants growing nearby. 
And these are these first three, the impatiens we talked about, the mimulus, and the clematis. And if we think about them, we can see why he would have had a similar idea about the clematis, which uh, the seed head of a clematis um, is like a little little tail. Very pretty. And this is the, what we see as old man's beard, the, the uh, seeds on the plants, on the hedgerows. You see them like clouds almost of white and grey, which are there in the, to, again towards the end of summer. So in September you begin to see this. And he would have looked at this, I think, and had a sense for the quality of what it felt like to see this. There's a lot of, I think there's a, there's a great sense that he's trusting to his intuition. I mean, think about that word intuition, what it actually, what is informing him in terms of information. And he senses that there is something, there is a message, if you will, in this plant and the way that the plant grows, and he relates that to what he's already observed and thought about for the clematis type of person. And if you can, you can think quite often uh, about looking at this, you, you can observe how people behave. I suggested how they sit, how they stand, how they walk is an aspect of it. I mean, the impatience person, as I say, is very upright. They walk, they would tend to walk on their heels, very directed and forward moving. The clematis person is much more on their toes, much more dreamy, much more languid, a bit like the, the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz, who is not really strong in the backbone. In patterns, very strong upright stem. The clematis, it's like a, it doesn't have a backbone, both the person and the plant. The stems of clematis trail across the trees, and often you can't tell whether they're going, you're, if you take hold of one, whether they're going towards the root or towards the sky. This is the kind of symbol, if you will, but it's not a symbol, it's literally the case. It's actually what is the expression of this state of mind. And this, uh, this is why I think it is, it is a very remarkable um, leap into a different level, a different dimension of interpreting what we see and what we feel and what we hear. Because it's saying that Nature contains a riddle. Everything that is actually around us is a very literal representation of what we are. We're not separate from the rest of the world. The rest of the world is as much a part of us as we are a part of it. And again, this is a great change in thinking because instead of saying, you're going to have this treatment, I'm going to give you some metals or some uh, chemical treatment for your problem. It's more to do with embracing and allowing in the life energies which are in the natural world. And this was very important for Bach because he wanted to find the, the positive forces that were... Uh, he wanted to find the positive forces which were inherent in the created world. He saw it as a created world. He, he definitely thinks of, um, I think he, he, he speaks directly in terms of God as the creator of the world. The great designer he thinks of. So he sees the integration of all living things as part of this one story of healing 
and of reconciliation to our own life and our own life purposes. And that's why for him it is a journey into healing. His own journey into healing. And what he learns in that journey he wants to share. Not only does he want to share it, he wants to share it immediately. It's extraordinary. No sooner does he find these new remedies than he writes in the homeopathic press uh, to tell people. So, February 1930, some new remedies and new uses. And this is published in the homeopathic world. Of course, Bach, he finds these three plants, Sympatians, Mimulus and Clematis. First thing he does, make the remedy, take it back to London and set to work. He takes it himself. That's very, very important. But he also gives it to uh, his patients and he starts to get results. Now this is again a time of great exploration and discovery. Many new ideas, are, uh, it's a ferment of new ideas in the 1920s. And he's part of it. And, well, let me just say what he says here. He talks about, we must admire the purity of the teaching of homeopathy and of nature and its constant aim to use only the remedies to be found in nature's materia medica. So he's looking for his remedies in nature's materia medica. He doesn't want to use the poisons that are very familiar in the homeopathic materia medica. He says, the following notes of remedies are being humbly offered to you, as I feel they cover some of the points which are amongst the mo more difficult to treat in the ordinary way, and it's hoped that they may be found of as much value to the profession in general as to those few who have already proved their value in practice. So, he discovers something, he not only puts it to test, but he gives it to his colleagues, saying, try this and see if it works. These new remedies actually contained two uh, remedies in, in, in 1930 that, that he abandons because they don't work. So it's quite an experimental process, this. <coughs> now, what we think of as a proper process for testing a new medicine is based upon I mean, it's, the, the great word is, uh, you know, empirical research. I think it's empirical. What do they call it? Ah, no. the, the, the great thing these days is to talk about evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine. That is, you must have evidence for efficacy. And in order to get evidence for efficacy, you have to have the double-blind placebo trial. And this is, you know really a very questionable process. I mean, we've, we've done work with uh, bark flower remedies with Professor Ernst at Oxford, uh, Exeter University. We've done work with Exeter University on this, with uh, a trial using bark flower remedies to help people with exam stress. Now, according to the results of the trial, it stated that there was no better result than you would expect with placebo. That is to say, pe people taking something believe it's going to help them. But what they didn't do was to declare that there was evidence-based improvement in the stress levels, but it came on day three, and they were a seven-day trial, and they were anticipating that the result should be on the seventh day. So they ignored it. And they said, it's a numerical aberration, a statistical anomaly, and therefore we won't take any notice of it. So, you know, how you interpret the information is absolutely crucial to whether or not you get the result that you want. So I don't really pay a lot of credence to double-blind placebo trials. 
but that's what we do now. What Bach did in the 1920s and the beginning of 1930 was to do something much closer to uh, Mimop. We you know about Mimot. Mimot is this, I have to remember, measure, measure yourself medical outcome profile, M-Y-M-O-P. So measure the outcome on yourself and see whether you feel better. Now that's quite an interesting concept because that's what he was doing. He said, I know that sometimes if somebody's being uh, stupid or not really listening to me, I'll get cross and irritable and I'll say, oh for goodness sake, look, please, will you pay attention to what I'm telling you? And that's the expression of empathians. So then he takes some of his homeopathically prepared empathians remedy and says, no, I don't mind, you take your time as, be as slow as you like. <laughs> and, and, it, and he notices that actually there is a difference in his temperament, it actually has an effect. And he's measuring for himself the medical outcome profile. Now that's quite an interesting difference. If taking a remedy changes your mind, how can you be sure that it's the remedy that did it? Well, you have to ask the person. There's no other way. You can't test the mind. You can't measure the mind. Emotions are not sort of something you can take like blood pressure and say, oh, your emotions are very high today. You have to know yourself. And that is the great revolution that's really wrapped inside the idea of a health benefit from taking bark flower remedies, is that it's a process of self-discovery. And going back to Bach's 12 types, you can see that the process of self-discovery has to be the place from which he starts. But then, as it develops, he can put himself in the place of other soul types and understand how it feels to be such a person. And then he can go and look towards a plant which would help that person. It's a kind of a, a stage of development that he's able to conduct. In fact, we can do this. We can do the same thing. But we have the benefit now of looking through the other end of the viewing glass, as it were, because if we look at the plant, we can see what the plant tells us about the person. Bach started from the person and went to look for the plant. But they're the two ends of the same thing. They are actually not even on a linear progression. They are a unified experience. So if we take, which one shall we take? I mean, look at agrimony. The way that agrimony grows, the way the flower actually chooses in a natural condition to uh, disperse itself as a population through a field mixed in with many other plants tells you something about the nature of the agrimony person. Again, it's, it's part of the story. If we look at chicory, chicory has a particular habit which is uh, it, it drops its seeds exactly at the feet of the mother plant. So you always get a group of chicory growing together. And this is an expression of the quality of the chicory soul type, the chicory remedy, and the chicory experience, that you want others to be close to you and to keep them within the area of your own control. Now, it's quite a complicated thing to make a, a formal analysis of a plant, and I don't think that's where Bach did it at the beginning. He may have checked it and thought it through later, but he must have had a sensitivity towards what the, if you like, the language of the plant and what it's saying. But if we take it to pieces now as an idea, 
we start to make a, a very definite analysis of plant structures in order to understand what's being shown. And uh, this, this, is a, this is a flower. <laughs> Don't know what kind of flower it is. And of course the flower grows on a stem and the stem has some sort of roots at the end in the earth and the plant has leaves of one kind or another. And here you have a picture of four elements at work. Earth, water, air and fire. The roots are in the earth, that seems fairly straightforward. The stem, the stem is what actually distributes the circulation of the uh, energetic properties, whether it's actually putting uh, sugars and starch down into the root to store them in a tap root, or whether it's actually sending water up to the higher, from the earth up to the, the top parts of the plant. The leaves are the element of air for the very simple reason that they are the lungs of the plant. They're where it breathes. And there are, in all green plants, there's chlorophyll. And the process of breathing is to take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. And this is C6H12O6. We can go through this. <laughs> I can show you this more easily. In a, in a graphic form. So these are the lungs of the plant and the element of air and the flower is the element of fire. Each element has its own particular qualities and its own nature. The reason that the, I say fire for the flower is because the quality of fire is to transform things. If you take hold of a piece of paper and you set a match to it, which is fire, it's transformed and it becomes something else. If you put a match to water, it doesn't really change. <laughs> well, it does if you apply enough fire to water. Water then becomes air. So fire has the capacity to, to transform in that way as well. The last thing, the other element which comes out from here is the, the fifth element, which is the seed. So that's the point of growth that comes out from the flower. Now in order to look at a plant, we need to see how these elements work together. I showed you the, let's start with the, the seed of the clematis. And that is, it's got this tail in order that it can travel in the air away from the mother plant and a distance traveling speaks of a kind of a, a, a need or a desire to move into the future. The seeds of the impatiens, The seeds of the impatiens, I said, are like bullets. They're fired at a, at a great acceleration. They come out of the pod at sort of 200 miles an hour, but they only travel a few feet, <laughs> a short distance. But they are fired strongly and down towards the earth. So if you compared the seeds of clematis and impatiens, and you compared the remedy state of these two, what you would actually say is that the clematis wants to get away from the world and the impatiens person wants to be directed down towards the earth. So the way in which the individual, and I'm going to speak of impatiens and clematis as plant person now, they are the same thing. So the way that impatiens takes up life opportunity is with great strength and determination. The way that the clematis takes up life opportunity is to drift away and want to be away from the earth.
in dreams.